Uh, my name is Ethan. I'm the pastor here at Forest Hill Church. And it's a pleasure to be together again for worship, uh, despite the news of, uh, of Janet's passing. And we'll keep you all in touch with um, services that will come in different ways. You might be able to come alongside the family and encourage them, give them uh, comfort in ways that God has comforted you through this time. <clears throat> We're at the conclusion of our series, Going Through the Ten Commandments, now reaching the Tenth Commandment. Do not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. I'm not sure if you picked this up through the first nine commandments. It's actually pretty easy to, to do the right things. It's so easy to do the right things. It's so easy just to be a goody two-shoe compared to other people, isn't it? Just ask that one proud, prosperous young man who came to Jesus one day and asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he said. Jesus answered, don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. The young man was so happy to hear all Jesus said. And he responded, I have kept all these things. What do I still lack? Perhaps by the end of this series and the Ten Commandments, you're wondering the same things. What do I still lack after all of this? It's as if the Ten Commandments were for us, people just like us, those goody two-shoes who have done all the right things our whole lives. In contrast to, you know, those other kids in the neighborhood that we grew up with. The first nine are pretty serious sins, but on the surface, they're easy to avoid. It does not take a lot of willpower to not murder somebody. What is unique about the Tenth Commandment is it gets right down to business, gets right to our hearts. It's not about the things we do, but about the things we desire. The word used for covet here is simply the word desire. Do not desire anything that belongs to your neighbor. So I'm sorry if you didn't want God or God's word or a preacher like me to get too close to your personal business. Well, it's too late now. You're here, and we're talking about the Tenth Commandment. Shows us we're not just accountable for what we do, but accountable for what we desire. Imagine that. When what we desire belongs to somebody else. It also makes it seem as if all those other violations of the commandment were simply symptoms the Tenth Commandment shows us the cause. The Tenth Commandment certainly flies in the face of the number one commandment of our modern or postmodern age, follow your heart. Follow your heart. Be true to yourself. Pursue the passions of your inner being, and don't let anybody tell you you can't. Now, for whatever truth and goodness might be here in pursuing things that are on our desire and us trying to help other people pursue the things that they desire. These kinds of mantras assume far too much. For example, these kinds of mantras, like follow your heart, assume that we only desire good things and that pursuing whatever we desire is the right thing. But what about a leader's desire to dominate? What about a lover's desire to take somebody else's spouse and parent? It also assumes that we have complete autonomy over our desires, as if there were no outside factors influencing what we desire. Author Charles Duhigg shows how this is simply not true. In his book, The Power of Habit, he documents how companies like Starbucks and Target, casinos, and even evangelical churches cause their consumers to unwittingly crave their products more and more. Third, these kinds of mantras like follow your heart ignores the fact that we can be consumed by our own desires, trapped by addiction through what was once an innocent delight and enslaved in self-denial. Follow your heart? Sometimes the worst thing that can happen to you is to get what you want. Our hearts are often deceitful, as the prophet Jeremiah reminds us. And if we're honest, we would admit that we don't even know the full extent of our motives. 
that we pursue things we desire. And so ancient Buddhist philosophy is, it comes, comes in and says, see, I told you so. Buddhist tradition teaches there's a simple solution to coveting. Eliminate desire altogether, believing that desire itself is inherently evil. Today, people are doing strange things to discipline their desires, like submerging themselves in an ice bath every morning or sleeping without a pillow. These are real trends happening today in order to try to confront head-on our covetous desires, which seem to be running rampant. But this level of denial over here in discipline also seems to go against some other things that Scripture has to say about desires. There are certain things that God actually made to be desirable, like in Genesis 2, every fruit in the Garden of Eden, which he gave to Adam and Eve. He said he made it good and desirable to eat. There are things that we ought to desire and glorify God in our enjoyment of them. Dutch commentator Dalma points out, we may long for children. There's nothing wrong with longing for children we don't have. We may long to improve our position in life. The book of Proverbs often contrasts the lazy man who is covetous with the diligent man who has planned his way and has ended up enjoying prosperity. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 13. It is the gift of God whenever anyone eats and drinks and enjoys what they've earned. There's, get this, there's even times for feasting. In other words, there's times for eating way too much than you should. After all, did not Jesus show up at the end of a wedding to provide gallons of the best wine that anyone had ever had that week? What is this telling us? All of the data here throughout Scripture is telling us desire doesn't seem to be the problem itself. Our problem is that we have disordered desires. That is, we desire some things which are wrong and destructive, and we desire other good things completely out of proportion to God's own place for it in our life. So how can we be changed into people who desire things according to God's good design? How can we be healed of these disordered desires? Well, rather than becoming slaves to our desires or legalistic aesthetics who forget how to enjoy life, the gospel redirects our desires toward God's glory in the coming new creation, such that we can find contentment here and now while we wait and also live with charity towards others. Well, let's start by taking a little closer look at what coveting is. It's more specific than desiring just anything, but desiring to have for yourself anything that somebody else owns, something that belongs to somebody else. We typically use the words envy or jealousy to describe coveting. For example, it's not wrong to necessarily to want a boat here on Cape Cod, but it is wrong to want your friend's boat. We look at other people's assets, other people's talents, other people's lifestyle, salary, spouse, and opportunities, and say, well, those are just a few of my favorite things. And if I only had them. So we play out fantasies of what that might be like to have our neighbor's things. And though many of us never go further than fantasy, it, it does pave the way for us to drive our coveting straight through other commandments, like stealing or adultery, which, of course, we all cover it up by lying. In our self-righteousness, we say we would never actually steal something from someone else or commit adultery, but the reality is, so long as we covet those things, the only difference between us and other people who follow through is the level of risk we face and the opportunities available. If the circumstances were just right, we would be right there too. Now, there's a few reasons that we shouldn't covet. First, it's not practical. It is very unpractical <laughs> to covet other people's things. And here we see God's wisdom in the 10th commandment. It's not practical. A, it builds bitterness in us towards the person we are coveting against. B, 
builds resentment in us for the things that we already have. And see, it might actually bring us in time to carry out a plan that ends up blowing up our life and our relationships. In short, coveting consumes us. It is a terrible poison to our hearts. But second, coveting is not just impractical, it's also immoral. And here we see God's righteousness in giving us the 10th commandment. Just consider the great commandment. Love God, love others. Coveting is wrong because rather than loving God, we inwardly despise him as the giver of everything that we have. Our coveting shows a disdain for the things God has seen fit to give us and a mistrust that what he has given us at this time is sufficient. Coveting is wrong because God is worthy of our gratitude. But coveting is also wrong because rather than loving our neighbor, we despise them. I mean, how would you feel if you found out somebody was coveting your things? And would... And if they just had the right opportunity, they would actually take it. Well, we would want them to change, right? We would want them to actually, hey, stop being jealous of what I have. Be happy for me. Why don't you just be happy for me, right? Coveting is wrong because our neighbor is worthy of dignity. If we truly loved our neighbor, we would rejoice in their prosperity and their happiness as we would want them to do for us. So I'm going to survey the book of Philippians to see how this all comes together. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to the book of Philippians as we look just at a couple passages. The Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians works through the issue of of coveting on many different levels. And we're going to start in chapter 2. He describes the exact opposite of a covetous life in chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Here's the opposite of living a covetous life, verse 3 of chapter 2. He says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. And he goes on explaining just how we can become these kinds of people. In verse 5, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, in the Greco-Roman world of the New Testament, people coveted perhaps nothing more than the opportunity to become a god, to become deified by the gods. They believed humans could become gods by carrying out heroic acts for what they'd done, by being admired, if they could, by the gods for maybe ruling as a mighty king, or by being given this as a gift, as a result of random acts of favor that a god might bestow on them. So when Paul is teaching this about Jesus, how he came down to our lowly estate. What was difficult to believe was not that a man could become a god. They already believed that. It was rather outrageous or ridiculous to think that a god would ever become a man. The people of the first century knew Jesus of Nazareth was a true man. There was no doubt about that. The scandal of the gospel was that Jesus uh, was not just what was not a man that had a potential to become a god, but that he was the one true god from eternity past and willingly chose to become a human being. And this is what the church has confessed for millennia through things like the Nicene and Athanasian creeds. God is one essence in three persons. One essence, three persons. Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, therefore shares the, divine, the single divine essence of the Father and the Spirit. The very glory of God that is worshipped eternally is Christ's glory. The very power of God that created the world is Christ's power. The very majesty of God seated on heaven's throne is Christ's own majesty. 
you and I covet because there's some emptiness within us that we desire to fill. For Jesus, there was nothing he could have possibly coveted. He had it all. He had harmonious fellowship with the Trinity. He had never-ending praise from angels around his throne. And he had sovereign rule over every nation. He also had the infinite wealth of all creation as God's firstborn. Yet while in this eternally glorious state, he didn't grasp for more or exploit what he had. But rather, he laid it all down. Taking on a true humanity in order to pursue a slave's death on a cross as a substitute in our place so that we who had sinned against and rebelled against our creator God could be renewed in his own glory according to his good design. We strive after other people's things and play out fantasies of what our life could be like while God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit planned out how Jesus might give up everything to redeem us. This is the good news of the gospel, that we are not left in our, with our covetous hearts and do the just judgment of God, that we can be reconciled to him through someone who laid it down on our behalf. Paul goes on in Philippians chapter 3 to tell about his own story of how he tried to fill this covetous void of his own heart and how Jesus completely changed him. Now, if you're not aware of this kind of Facebook page, you need to know there's something called a buy nothing page. Basically, every town has their own buy nothing page. You can post something to give away to somebody else, and you're not allowed to buy anything. It's all for free. And this is when spouses begin to debate. What is somebody else's trash, and what is a treasure? We all disagree. At times, I'm telling my wife, no, that man's trash is our future trash. Sometimes she's telling me that, and we go back and forth. How can you tell if something is garbage or not? We don't always know. Sometimes we're completely fooled. But rather than being fooled by all that the world could have offered the Apostle Paul, he was able to see with new eyes that had been changed by the gospel. To see that how everything this world could have offered him was ultimately garbage in comparison to knowing Christ. And this is the way the gospel changes us, even what we desire. Paul was pursuing a career as a rabbi and was training under a highly respected rabbi named Gamaliel, who was the best known Pharisaic sage of his era. Josephus, who is a Jewish historian from the first century, shows that Gamaliel's son would go on to become in the highest elite um, of Pharisees a generation later. Now, I can only imagine that the Apostle Paul knew Gamaliel's son and perhaps studied with him side by side. His life, upbringing, and career were all leading him in this direction. As he says in chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, listing all these accolades and earthly privileges he had. Yet after listing all of these things, he says in verse 7, you can look with me in verse 7 and 8, that whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. When we covet, we desire, we can only desire two things, really, status or stuff. In the place of the greatest status we could ever acquire on earth, or all the stuff this world could offer you, Christ grants us the status of his own righteousness and the inheritance of his own resurrection, making everything else we once desired as, value to, uh, as valuable to us as our neighbor's junk. So he goes on, verse 8 and 9. I consider everything I could have acquired in life as garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from keeping the law, but a righteousness which is through faith in Christ. Verse 10. So I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, 
and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Because God makes us eternally wealthy in Christ, there's nothing left in this world for us to covet, which is why we can be content with what we have and charitable toward other people. So let, let me move from con, uh, coveting to contentment. Throughout his letter, the Apostle Paul is complimenting and thanking the Philippian church for all they have given him. But he qualifies his own gratitude so that he doesn't give off the impression that he is coveting the kinds of things they have provided him. So he says in chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 11, I'm not saying these things. I'm not giving you all these compliments and telling you about everything you've given me because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it's like to be in need. I also know what it's like to have plenty. I learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether I live with plenty or in want. In fact, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Translated, I can be content in all circumstances because Christ strengthens me. Therefore, he doesn't say this, I'm ad-libbing here, as you continue to give of yourself toward others in the ministry of the gospel, know that, he goes on in verse 19, that as you continue to give, my God will supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Now notice these pronouns and prepositions of verse 19. Paul does not say, God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory. He says, my God will meet all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. There is surpassing value being found in Christ Jesus because that is where the riches of the glory of God are kept. What's more, when you are united to Christ by being clothed in his own righteousness, the living God over all creation becomes my God and your God in our heavenly Father. Now, when I was growing up, I had one friend that I thought was super, super rich. As I become an adult, I, didn't, I, I realized he wasn't super, super rich. We just really, really weren't. I thought he was super rich because he had hungry, hungry hippos. He also had an in-ground pool. As I got older, they got four-wheelers, and I could go over his house and drive all over the place. I loved going over Randy's house. But I don't remember coveting his stuff. I don't remember wishing that I had it or being disappointed that we didn't. And perhaps the reason why is because I knew I could just go over his house. I could just go over his house. You know what? And I got to some point where he didn't even need to be there. His parents knew me so well. I remember going back as an adult and just saying hi to them. This is part of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. All of his stuff becomes as good as our stuff. When we are covered in his own righteousness, we are adopted by God as children and treated as if we were his own firstborn. Nothing is withheld back from you when you go into God's house behind Jesus Christ. Now, God does supply the need of all creation as a benevolent creator. We know this from Bible passages such as Psalm 104 and Acts 17, verse 25. But there is a significant difference for those who are in Christ. For God supplies our needs not just as creator anymore, but as father. This is the way Jesus encourages his own disciples. When Jesus says in Matthew 6, as you store up treasures for yourself in heaven... Be content under your heavenly Father's care. Don't worry about your life, he says, what you will eat or drink or, what your, uh, or about your body, what you, are, you will wear. Your heavenly Father feeds the birds of the sky. Aren't you worth more to him than they? Your heavenly Father clothes the flowers of the field in splendor. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? So don't worry saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. 
So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you. We can be content knowing that because we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, our Heavenly Father cares for us more than anything else he has ever created. And when we don't have what we think we need, we can defer to God's wisdom. As Jesus said in this passage, is not life more than food and clothing? Maybe that's one reason God withholds certain things from us that we think we need so that we could have other things that neither our wants or needs could ever give. Like the learned character trait of contentment and reliance on God. Contentment is the antidote to coveting, but contentment alone does not bring us yet to fulfill the Tenth Commandment on the other end. We can keep the Tenth Commandment by being content, but we can't fulfill it until we have turned around towards others in charity. What I mean by charity is sharing. This reminds me a lot about our situation in life right now with young children. Toddlers are terrible sharers. They're great coveters, really good coveters. They see something somebody else has, and all of a sudden, it must be theirs. And yet, as if they're just like bopped on the head with a fairy's wand, they completely transform when they see something else they want. They completely transform into the best sharers you would ever you could ever imagine. Oh, here you go, sister. What has happened there? He didn't become a, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit in that moment. What happened was he saw something else he wanted instead. That his sister hasn't yet seen. So to keep her preoccupied, lest she also see this new prize. He says, oh, here you go. You can have it. This is how it works. A large portion and purpose for Paul's letter to the Philippian church was to report, as I said, all the things that he's received from them, to thank them for it, and to encourage them to continue to live such lives of charity. They poured themselves out to support Paul in his ministry. They went above and beyond what a lot of other churches have done. They even sent Epaphroditus on a dangerous journey to bring him supplies. He risked his own life in doing this. So when the Apostle Paul says, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory, what he's doing is turning the gaze of our covetous hearts off the things of this world and pointing us to something so much better that's coming our way. The glory of the new creation, which we will inherit, which those who are in Christ will receive. When God raised Jesus from the dead, he appointed him as the heir of all things. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. In Romans 8, says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit. And the spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. And the apostle Peter writes, Therefore, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that is imperishable, that is undefiled, that's unfading and kept in heaven, preserved in heaven for you. You've heard it said that one man's trash is another man's treasure, but one man's trash is simply another man's future trash. Everything that we covet after is temporary. Even if you were to get that thing you covet after, it will once be gone again. You will probably lose it all before you die. Yet even if you keep something until your death, the moment of your death, it, it immediately becomes somebody else's property. And who knows if that person will be a fool or not. This is unlike everything we will acquire in the resurrection. For everything in the resurrection is incorruptible. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Therefore, 
don't store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but rather store up treasures for yourself in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. And he reminds his covetous disciples who are wondering what their condition will be for following Jesus. He reminds them in Mark chapter 10, don't worry about that. For there is no one who has left house or brother or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, who will not receive a hundred times more now at this time with persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. So this is why we can, on the other hand, be like that benevolent toddler who, seeing a much greater prize, is happy to give away the very thing that we once fought over. In Christ, we're now free to live and free to give because we don't need life and possessions to provide for us the ultimate needs which we are searching for them uh, in. Hidden in the righteousness of Christ, we know the God of all creation as our Father, and we have our own inheritance waiting for us as we follow in the very resurrection of Jesus Christ. So back to Philippians 2. So do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more valuable and important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interest, but rather to the interest of others. So two quick ways we can think about turning from coveting to charity. First, hospitality. Mis, mi casa, su casa. We can be hospitable with the things we have. We can willingly share them and allow other people to enjoy their benefit. Every day should be like a party where people just come, where people are able to come over. We shouldn't be clinging so tightly to our stuff that nobody else is able to enjoy the benefits of the things God has given us. Why hold on to this? Why not share? Why not enjoy the, the joy of hospitality with other people? and demonstrate in our life that w we know this isn't our stuff anyways, and we have got so much better stuff coming our way, which will never fade away. Be hospitable with what you have. Second, give. We know we ought to be generous, but how should we qualify this? Well, first, it, this, um, our calling to give and give things away that we'll never get back says nothing about how much you earn or acquire in life, but about how much you keep for yourself. So if you earn a lot, good for you. I hope you make more. It's not about how much you earn, but how much you keep, which reflects where our hearts are at. Pastor John Piper writes, don't be deceived into thinking that a six-digit salary must be accompanied by a six-digit lifestyle. It's very difficult to do that when you're around a, bu a bunch of people who are in your category or maybe just a little um, outside of um, your status in life. But for however much you make, it doesn't mean that you have to show it. You have to live like this. On another occasion, the Apostle Paul writes a letter to Timothy on how he should train and disciple and encourage wealthy people. Notice he doesn't say, Sell all your possessions and give to the poor, like Jesus told that one man to expose his own covetous heart. But he says, rather, be on guard against the temptation that wealth provides, uniquely brings to your life, and be rich in good deeds toward others. If anything, it just means you can give more. And isn't giving, if you think about it, probably the best strategy against coveting? It's kind of hard to covet things you regularly give away. Because God has made us eternally wealthy in Christ, there's nothing left in this world for us to covet, which is why we can be content with what we have and charitable towards others. Let's just take a few quiet moments now to pray and respond to God. Perhaps there are things in your life you realize are vain and you need to repent of coveting after the vanities of life. Perhaps you've been discontent or too strict, you little Scrooge, holding on to all your stuff. How might we show our gratitude for God's gospel and let the gospel 
sink into our hearts and completely reshape the kinds of people we are. Would you receive the gospel today and be reminded of all that God has given for you in Jesus?